truth, Lord God, O oh God, and apply it to our lives. I pray that you have your way in this Bible study, and we give you the glory, the honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. All right. Um, we're getting on along, aren't we? Going, we're going, going pretty good. We're out of the book of Daniel. Um, now that doesn't mean that there isn't more to study and to learn from Daniel, just this particular Bible study transitions um, when they transition. And the last thing that we read about was um, Daniel's revelation that their captivity was for 70 years, that the land of Jerusalem was only to lie desolate for 70 years. And after that, God would bring his people back into the promised land. Um, and this he is doing because of the covenant he made with David. For he told them in the generations to come, if they commit iniquity, he was going to chastise them with the rod of men um, and with the children of men. But he said, his mercy shall never depart from them. So even in God's judgment and chastisement, it was not indefinite toward them. It was not to be considered uh, something that would wipe them out forever. He always had a plan. One prophet said, my thoughts I have to you are, are of good and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. And uh, I love that about the Lord is that even when we think it's over, God has something left for us, at least in this dispensation that we call grace. And so he had driven them out of the promised land uh, to confirm his word that he he warned them that if you do not keep my commandments and all of these curses, if you can read about them in Deuteronomy 28, he had fulfilled that and they were caused to <clears throat> cause to leave their land, leave Jerusalem leave Judea. Um, they were taken captive. A lot of them were killed. Many of them were taken captive. And Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, the walls were destroyed. The temple was destroyed. All of the precious artifacts of the temple were taken into Babylon. Uh, we read about how King Belshazzar um, so callously used those sacred items for his parties, his pagan parties. And that's what got God pretty upset at him. Um, to rip the kingdom from him and cause the Medo-Persian Empire to come in. Uh, we read about the faith of Daniel throughout this whole time and also the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the, the ways that God tested him and also his resilience in the face of uh, persecution, in the face of opposition, in the face of peer pressure. We read about Daniel's resilience there. <clears throat> and finally, we come to the point where he begins to pray and he, because he finds out that um, the 70 years is almost complete. That was in Daniel chapter 9. 70 years is almost complete. So he begins to pray a prayer of repentance for his people. He doesn't just pray a prayer of repentance for himself. He prays a prayer of repentance for all of his people. It's like he's praying as if he himself committed all of their sin, which is a powerful posture of what the scripture calls as intercession. When you stand in the gap for somebody else, think of Abraham as God had forewarned Abraham that he was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham begins to stand in the gap and says, God, will you destroy it if you find 50 righteous? Anybody remember that story? And then he says, God says, no, I won't destroy it if I find 50. Then he, he very patiently and reverently walks it down from 50 to 45. And God says, no, I won't destroy it if I find 40. 45, and then he goes to 40, and then he goes to 30, and then he goes to 20, and the last number was 10. God said, I won't destroy it, um, and I believe the reason why God did that is because he's actually looking for us, um, those of us who know God and are endeavoring to live for God. I think he's looking for us to stand in the gap for those who don't, for our Muslim people out here who, who think that Allah is their God and Muhammad is their prophet. Um, when Jesus said, clearly, no man cometh to the Father but by me. He wants us to stand in the gap. And, and not only that, pray as if their sin is our sin. Yes, sir. Yeah, 100%. When he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that was his bride that was killing him. Imagine that. Yes, he is, a, he's, he is the ultimate mediator. Meaning that, yes, God was in Christ. Scripture says, reconciling the world to himself. But there needed to be the death of flesh in order to get us back.
back reconciled with God and the Christ, Jesus the Christ. That's what that word means. It means the anointed flesh. It's not his last name. When you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Yeshua or Jesus, the anointed flesh. And that that is this this Christ that came to. Oh, you have a question? Well, okay. I mean, yeah, I know what you're talking about, Juan. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll talk with him. I mean, he's, he's, he's been baptized the right way. Um, it, it's the name. Christ is not a portion of his name. Christ is actually a description of who he is. The Christ in the Greek term is Christo, which means the anointed flesh. In the Hebrew, it's Yeshua Amashiach. That Mashiach is the anointed flesh. That's what we're saying. So when you say Christ, you're not saying his last name. You're describing the flesh that, that God has dwelled in at that, that moment in time. And I bring that up because you're right. He, the Bible scripture calls him a propitiation. He's the ransom for our sin. Okay. And without his sacrifice and his blood, we have no access to God. That's why when he died, the veil was torn in the Holy of Holies. And the scripture tells us in Hebrew that we can come boldly to the throne of grace because he, his body was broken for us. And so we have access through his righteousness and through his blood and through his sacrifice. So um, in, in, a, in, a, in a probably the greatest way, Jesus is our intercession. Um, the, script, the Bible even, Paul even teaches this in Romans chapter 8 when he says, the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered because he that is knoweth and searches the heart of man and you know what is, a, what is the mind of the spirit so he make intercession for the saints so yes there's, we, can't, we can't get like Jesus said no man cometh to the father the father being the spirit that was on the inside of him you can't get to that spiritual place except through Jesus Christ because he stood in the gap for us and so the same posture um, he's expecting us to take on for the world, to be honest with you, to pray. Um, he even told a parable to this effect. I know I'm taking long, but I'm just going to camp right here for a second. He even told a parable to this effect um, about the, uh, Luke 18 when he said, he told this parable that men should always pray and not faint. And the parable was about a woman, a widow who was complaining to an unjust judge that didn't regard man or fear God at all. And she would rise up every day and cry to this judge saying, avenge me of mine adversary. <clears throat> the assumption is the reason why she's a widow is because somebody killed her husband. And Jesus said bec not, he would rise up and avenge her, not because he cares for her or regarded her, but because of her continual coming. <laughs> Basically because she's annoying. She won't stop coming to me saying, avenge me of mine adversary. Will he rise up? And the, the understanding then, if the unjust judge will grant a request because of, un, because of continual coming, how much more the just judge will answer our request when we bring our petition for him, before him? Say, yeah, I know you didn't answer me yesterday, but... I really want you to save my family. And our adversary is the enemy of our soul, the devil. You know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, scripture says, but against principalities and powers and rules of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. So this posture of standing in the gap, it was even spoken of the priesthood in Joel chapter 2. He said he wanted the priest to come out from the altar and stand between the altar and the porch, almost like bridging the gap between the people that were on the outside and the people that were on the inside. And so Daniel took this posture in prayer for, for God. I mean, he's praying, God, forgive us of our iniquity and forgive us of our idolatry and all of our sin. And he's praying for all of Israel as if he himself had committed the sin. And then God speaks to him, and we talked about this last time. He gave him the blueprint for the remainder of the generations, those 70 weeks about the time that commandment is given to rebuild the temple to the time that Messiah is cut off will be 69. And I'm not going to go into that in review. Um, but we shift from there uh, to the book of Nehemiah. Now, if you are in your Bible 
and you have a hard copy Bible, I don't have mine, mine's in the office, uh, you'll notice that the books we're getting ready to read is actually before the book of Daniel. Anybody ever been confused about the order of the books in the Bible? Why is it like that? Well, here's, here's why. Um, the first section, we talked about the law. What, what is the law? See, a bit of a review. What are the books in the law? If I say the law, what am I saying? First five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, uh, Numbers, Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy, Exodus. I missed Exodus, sorry. Brains. All right. After that, that's, that's, that's what's considered the law. So when Jesus said, I came to fill all this written in the law, he's talking about those, those first five books. Hebrews calls it Torah. Sometimes it's called the Pentateuch, which is just five, means, means, the, means the law. Okay. The next category of books is from Joshua all the way until what book? Esther. And that is the history of Israel as a nation. Because Joshua, they come into the promised land. They start bat winning battles, taking territory, all that, all that great stuff. And then the, it goes all the way to Esther. Now, the understanding is that those last three books of the history section, Esther, Nehemiah, and Ezra, those three books actually occur after the Babylonian captivity. That makes sense? So if you're reading it chronologically, most of the prophets that you read actually occur during the time of Samuel's, the Kings, and the Chronicles. And it's a, it's a pretty cool study. There's a chart. I don't have it with me. But there's a chart that I have that correlates the prophet to the king that they spoke to and the time that they prophesied to. And that little bit of information makes the, make, makes the, the prophets like Isaiah much more understandable or a prophet like Amos. Like who is he talking to and when is he talking to him and why is, you know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, a bit of easy understanding is that the last three books of the uh, prophets are also after the captivity. So Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, those three prophets prophesied once they came back from their captivity in Babylon. Put some things into understanding. <clears throat> and then the Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi, which was the last God-ordained prophet. There are other books that are written between those times, between the Old and New Testament, but they weren't prophetic books, and it wasn't ordained of God, meaning God didn't speak through anybody and com commission them. There are plenty of historical books. Um, the Catholic Church uses some of them. they call the Apocrypha, the Maccabees, and things of that nature. They fulfill history within that gap. They may be accurate, but they are not spirit-inspired. That's the difference. Sometimes you get people to say, well, they left some of the books out. Yeah, but they did it on purpose. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Um, because there are lots of books that may be historically accurate, but not God-inspired. I can write a book that's historically right and correct, but if it's not God-inspired, because the Old Testament canon was already complete by the time Jesus came on the scene. They even had a Greek version of it called the Septuagint. It was already complete, and with, they've already confirmed this with the Dead Sea Scrolls, 2,000-year-old scrolls that they found. That is a 99 point some percentage accuracy that the scriptures are, are correct. So that's just a little bit of information on the structure of the Old Testament and why our version is like it is. The Hebrew Bible is a little different. I don't have time to go into those details today. But suffice it to say that when we hop back into Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Ezra, and uh, Esther, those books take place after their 70 years once the Jews had already started to come back. Ezra deals with the rebuilding of the temple and the establishing of the priesthood. Nehemiah deals with the rebuilding of the wall um, and some other, some other details. Um, Esther deals with the Jews that remained in the area of Babylon, which would be the Medo-Persian Empire. So there were Jews, once they gave the command, they stayed there. And as Esther deals with that, and so I, I think it's a wonderful story. Uh, maybe we'll touch on Esther. I don't think it's in this Bible study. I'm not sure. Uh, the, the new abridged version might include it. All right. Is that clear as mud? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry. Say that for first part again. All 
I don't, I don't, it doesn't give the explanation. Not very clearly. Um, I would imagine they had just made it to home. Their lives were so comfortable. They had established, you know, which is possible. Um, Especially if you're going to be, it's not like Jerusalem, they would be able to govern themselves in Judah, Judea. Meaning that after they, after God sent them into captivity, the Jews never ruled themselves ever again until 1948. They were always up under the a province of another higher power government. So legally speaking, it wouldn't have been much different for them to go back to Jerusalem because they still would have been up under, for example, the Grecian Empire or the Roman Empire. Um, and in the case of Esther, it would still have been the Medo-Persian Empire. And if life is good, <laughs> uh, and Esther, I would say, had it pretty good. Mordecai, I think he had it pretty uh I think he had it pretty good. He, st- he stood in the king's gate. Nehemiah, we're getting ready to read about, he was the king's cupbearer. So they had, they had built a life for them. And that's a good, a good segue into this fact. <clears throat> their captivity changed their culture. They had to rename a lot of their months. For example, the, month, the first month was for them was Abib. And during the Babylonian captivity, it was changed to the Nisan which is the Babylonian name for one. So their months changed. They implemented feast. Feast of Purim came by Esther. Um, the Feast of Dedication came also through that. So a lot of their culture changed because of their captivity as well. You know, because you're going to assimilate to whatever culture you're in. If, you, if I take your family out and put you in, if I put you in, I don't know, Argentina for 70 years, you know, I guarantee you they're going to speak. They speak Portuguese. Spanish and Argentina, really? It's Portuguese in Brazil, it's Spanish in Argentina. Huh? Okay, I don't know much about the history of South America, so I need to do some studying there. I've been looking up World War II, Euro- European, Russian history, it's fascinating to me. All right, that's off topic. Let's go to some biblical history, shall we? Nehemiah, chapter number one. Um, I guess we could just start in verse one. Go ahead. Who's in my reader tonight? Oh, you got it? Thank you, sir. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah, and it came to pass in the month Shilesu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of, the br- one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left on the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let excuse me. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine e- eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray, pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest my, thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter ye, you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, through, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set up my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand, O Lord. I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the ear prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Okay. So, Brother Bill, if you could pull up that image, if you have it, uh, while I kind of go through this first chapter. The chapter starts off with Nehemiah, an interesting fact. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Nehemiah. Yeah, I listened to a guy by the name of Nehemiah. Uh, he was a Karaite Jew. He was standing in Jerusalem, 
And every time he said his name, he would say, Nehemiah. I was like, oh, man, I've been saying it wrong the whole time. Nehemiah, no, Nehemiah. You know, I find kind of, I don't have the guttural sound right just yet. So I'm working on it, though. I really, I really want to, I'm, I'm going to take some biblical. I'm going to take some biblical Hebrew classes. One of my goals is to speak, is to speak Hebrew, is to speak it fluently. I don't, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I got to find the time and the finances to do it, but it's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and so he is, is Nehemiah, and, and it was the 20th year. Uh, the Bible says he was in the palace because he was a cupbearer. And some of his brethren from Judah came back, and he asked them how things were going. And they told him, they said, we're not doing so well. Um, Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, and the gates are burned with fire. So he sees the state of his country, his, his city, and he begins to be afflicted because of they, it's in ruins. They're not, they're not having a good go of it, um, trying to rebuild this city, uh, which is a pattern. Anytime you try to rebuild or build or do something for God in general, there's always going to be opposition. Um, opposition doesn't mean that you're doing the wrong thing. Opposition sometimes means that you're on the right track. You know, I've, I've met and have lived before to say, well, if, if it's meant to happen, it'll just happen. That's not necessarily true when it comes to the things of God. Um, actually, I believe God uses opposition to test our faith. To see if we're willing to go forward through opposition. And we'll talk about that more as the study goes on. But he talked about the wall. It's, this is a 3D rendition. Remember, Tom, I was telling you the video that I posted on, on Telegram? It was, it was like, a, if, if you go back and watch that, it's great. Because this doesn't start off looking like that. It starts off as plain. But through time, you can, you can see as, as best as they can, you know, depict it nowadays. You can see the growth of the city of Jerusalem and the three mountains that it sat on. Now, I'm going to go and point because I tried, tried to capture as much as I could. You see that big building back there and the way in the back? That's the temple that is uh, Mount Moriah. And the building around that. There's the royal court and the, 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 uh, the court of the Gentiles and the women's court that Solomon built to surround that. You see the walls on the inner parts? Those are the original walls that were built to surround that city of Jerusalem. But when the Assyrian army came and took control of the northern kingdom of Israel, there were refuges that started to settle in Jerusalem and in Judea around the city. So they had to build more walls. These are these outer walls you can see. They had to build more walls around the city in order to keep them protected. There's even a proverb that says, it talks about controlling your anger, that if you can't control your anger, you're like a city without walls. Well, what's the understanding? If you don't have any walls, your enemy can come in anytime they want to. It's not like today we have planes and, you know, satellites in space that can see everything. In this warfare, this, uh, I guess, ancient warfare, if you didn't have walls, you were, you were vulnerable. And the enemy could just come in any time they wanted to. So I, I put this up there because you have an idea of why Nehemiah is so distraught and upset about this. And you also have an idea of the task that he's about to accomplish in 52 days. Now, I don't know, I'm not sure anybody knows, the territory in which they built the wall. I don't know if they had to rebuild the outer walls. I don't know if they just rebuilt the walls around the city because there's some valleys in there around that weren't originally part of Jerusalem. They kind of built the walls to, so people could live further out. Um, Solomon did all the expansion up on the mountaintops is what you're seeing there. Um, but suffice it to say, if you're trying to rebuild the temple where that temple sits, you're going to need walls. And without it, your enemy can just run up and come in, you know. It, it would be like you having a house with no walls, just kind of like an outdoor house. Most people's houses have walls <laughs> or gates and fences, you know. And so this is, what, this is what we're looking at. And when Nebuchadnezzar came in, he destroyed all of that. This image is supposed to be during the time of Hezekiah, which is... One of the kings spoken about, I think it's in 2 Kings uh, chapter 19. You can read about Hezekiah. So that, I don't know, images help me to understand. And when I see stuff like this, it gives me an idea of, of what we're really looking at. 
and the gravity of the people. They were let go. They were released to go back into the land of Jerusalem to build God's house and to reestablish it. And this is the task that is before them. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar wiped all of that out. He laid waste to, he laid siege to Jerusalem, burned everything down, took all the expensive stuff, and took it captive. So they're starting from scratch. And this report that Nehemiah gets is very bad. And he goes into intense fasting and praying over it because God has given him a burden. And he prays before God, and, and it's very similar to Daniel's prayer. that better okay so he adopts the sin of the people as he's praying he says i pray before thee now day and night for the children of israel for thy servants and confess the sins of the children of israel which have sinned against thee both i and my father's house have sinned we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments um, nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou which thou commandest thy servant moses and then this is another a good uh, prayer tip, verse 8, if you could pull that up. Remember, there it is. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet I will gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name. Here's the prayer tip. Pray God's word. Remind him. You see this all the time throughout scripture. And it's very powerful because one, it's going to help your faith because faith cometh by hearing and hearing, hearing by the word of God. Um, two, it's going to give you empowerment and prayer before God because he's going to keep his word. And you know if you're praying his word, you're praying his will. So learn his word and use it in prayer, and it's going to help you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you mean like, yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. I mean, if, if you're going to pray it, yeah, you should speak it, you know. Um, but there's nothing wrong with listening to the word as well. Um, most of the time, if I'm going to pray it, I'm, I'm, I'm praying it, you know, so I'm going to read it. Um, that's different than reading it for study purpose or understanding purposes. Normally, when you're praying the word of God, you're not really praying it to study it at the moment. You're praying it because you're doing what Nehemiah just did, is reminding God that you said that if we turn to you, you know, that, that, that type of prayer. So it's, it's almost like you're taking what God said and rephrasing it and reminding him of his promises that he's spoken. That, to me, is a different thing than your devotion time where you're sitting down and reading your Bible for informational purposes or, or just to ingest it for yourself. So... Um, in either case, listening to it is fine, but it also depends on how you learn. For example, I used to teach the youth Bible study, and um, there was one guy in there that he's, he didn't want to read, and I thought for a long time he just didn't like me, you know. <laughs> but he said, no, I just, I learn, I retain it better if I listen to it and not read it out loud. Like, he would look at the words and listen to it while he was looking at it, because if he were speaking he will be more concerned about speaking it correctly than actually learning from it. And that's not how, that's not me. I can read it and, and comprehend it, but not everybody's like that. And I didn't, I, I was ignorant. I didn't know that. So um, it, it really, did, this, is, this is for studying, though. If you're praying, you need to read it, speak it out. Or you may not even need to read it. You may have memorized it if you're praying it. Um, but if you're going to study it, use whatever method's best for you to retain it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we're, we're spoiled because 
We have it on our phones. We have it on our tablets. We have printed versions of it everywhere. I mean, they're burning Bibles because there's so many of them printed, you know. Bookstores don't even keep them when they get used Bibles. They just burn them because there's so many of them out there. But you understand the printing press was invented when in the 1600s? Before then, if you wanted a copy of the scripture, you had to have a scribe and probably be part of the Roman Catholic Church. And it was very expensive to get a copy of the scrolls. And if you could get it, it was probably written in Latin. And you didn't, nobody read, read Latin or Greek or whatever language. The guy that started to translate King James Version, they killed him. Don't you know? There, there was a struggle to get these translations out. It's not a, so my point is, during biblical times, people didn't have access to just go read the scriptures. Paul actually brings this out because he commands Timothy, make sure you read the scrolls out loud before the people. They didn't have Bibles at home. So the only way they could come and hear the word of God is they came to church. And the preacher would have a copy of the scrolls. And he would read it out, kind of like Jesus when he went before the temple. And there was a portion of Torah right there for him to read. There's a reason why they set it up like that. They just didn't have the word at, at their houses. So, yes, it's 100% okay to listen. <laughs> if you're, well, you know. If you're busy, I wouldn't make it your only time that you, you know, we are, we are spoiled in this generation. Like I said, we've got it here. We've got, I've got every translation at my fingertips. I've got all the versions, you know, I've got the concordance right here. We've got so much access to the word of God. It's not even, we have no excuse. We have no excuse. We just don't desire it, you know, um, maybe as much as other generations do. But so my, my, I say that to say it is perfectly fine to listen to the word of God. That was a very long answer to your question, and I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yeah, underground, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, they have to hide it. <laughs> David said, I hide it in my, yeah. And so... Um, it's going to help your. It's going to help your prayers too. If you can, if you can memorize. Now, when I say <clears throat> memorize the Word of God, you don't have to memorize the King James Version. Thou, O Lord, hast spoken unto thy servant and told thy servant that thou shalt make thy ways to prosper. I know it sounds great, and me personally, I feel something, but I'm probably the only one that's feeling something. <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it, King James is that way because it was translated during the Shakespearean era. So you have a lot of that old English methods of speaking, which is not necessary um, to, to pray. You know, if you read it in one version, you're probably going to memorize it in your most favorite version. And, 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 and that's fine. Um, I'm not getting into the diversion debate today. I'm more speaking when you pray it. It's okay to pray it in your own language. I think that will help you to understand it if you can read it maybe in the King James and then regurgitate it back out in a way that you understand. You know, so don't, don't get caught up. I have to pray, thine, O Lord, art a shield for me, the glory and the lifter up of mine head. It's, that's a psalm. That's how it's written in the King James Version. But if you read it in the Amplified, you'll have, it'll be twice as long, you know. If you read it in the NLT, it'll be like, Lord, you're my shield. You lift up my head. <laughs> That's perfectly fine to say it that way. I, I don't know. Maybe some people have pet peeves of that, but I just want to put that out there. Does that help? Amen. Okay, so Nehemiah has a burden. Everybody say burden. burden. But burdens are incomplete if you don't have plan, structure, and organization. This is one of the most valuable things about the book of Nehemiah is leadership. Leadership. Nehemiah is one of the best outside of Moses and Jesus and all of it. He's one of the best examples of a leader that has a burden and marries that burden with proper planning, organization, and structure to accomplish a mission and a task. That's what you're going to learn. And I, I bring that out because there's a misconception that Everything that God is going to use us to do is going to be super kooky spiritual. It's not. God is going to give you a burden just like he did for Nehemiah. There's going to be 
You're going to have his heart. You're going to have his passion. You're going to have a desire to do something for God. And it's going to require you to go into prayer and to fasting and to seek the face of God and repent and do everything that Nehemiah did. But after you get done doing all that, guess what you got to sit down and do? We got a plan. You have to have a plan. You have to have some structure. God had a plan. He didn't just create the earth in one day. He stretched this thing out over six days. And everything that he put into plan built up on the previous day. Can't have fish for this water. Can't have birds for their sky. You can't have animals before there's grass and herb in the, sea, in, 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 in the field. They need food. What are they going to eat? If you, create, if you create the cows before you create the grass, the cows are going to die. So God had a plan. Now, he's God Almighty. He could have spoke everything into existence in one day, but he didn't do it. He did it systematically and even built in, I'm resting. So guess what, people of God? Spirituality is of the utmost importance. That's absolutely right. We must pray to get our direction from God. We must pray to get a burden from God. We must pray to get the heart and the mind of God. We must pray to get our marching orders. But after you get done praying, how are you going to accomplish what you prayed for? And all throughout Scripture, there is a plan given, but there's also what you have is necessary. God didn't just call Moses and send him. When Moses said, how, how, how am I going to prove to them that you sent me? He said, what's in your hand? Oh, you got that rod. Okay, so take what you already have. Surrender it over to me, and I'll do the supernatural. So it's a marriage of the supernatural and the practical that produces the glory of God. And Nehemiah is a great example of this. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter number 2, and let's see uh, what happens here. Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the kingdom. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my, not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? Mm. So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come till I come into Judah, mm -hmm. and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Pause there. So you see this. He had the burden. He had already been praying. And now, I forget what successful entrepreneur it was that says success is when preparation meets opportunity. Anybody know who, who said that? Success is when preparation meets opportunity. That's a famous quote. I just don't remember who. I know. If nobody says it, it's mine. <laughs> Think of Steve. I, I was going to say the app was uh, Steve Jobs. It might be. But it's true, though. It was? Bing, bing, bing. I can't claim it. Well, technically, he's dead, so... No, they they remember. If if we knew, I can't. Pastor Crow said success. I'll just put it in the King James Version and claim it. <laughs> so put some these and thous in it and I'll claim it for myself. Amen. But it is 100% true. Your, your burden must be mixed with planning. And this is natural and spiritual. Because what if God opens the door and the opportunity. People don't know this or realize this, but God is an investor. Jesus told a whole parable about talents. He said, I gave one five, one two, and one one. He went away for a long time and expected to have ten, four, and two, or at least one with interest. 
And the guy that didn't do anything with it said, you could at least put it in the bank. I could have made some interest. He said, take the one from him, give it to the guy that had 10, take the unprofitable servant and cast him into outer darkness. The Lord was an investor. Time. He expected his investment to grow over time. And furthermore, expected his disciples to understand that, par that parable. The Lord's an investor. And so God won't give you more than you can prove that you can handle. That'd be a waste of investment. Even Jesus said, if you're going to build a tower, sit down and count the cost first. So we can't, we can't hop over the natural discipline, the planning, the structure, and the organization that is required when it comes to doing something for God. Because I, I know what happens. We get motivated. Yes, God has dealt with me, and I've got a burden. I'm just going to go. Well, okay, but try that on Shark Tank and see what happens. They're going to say, what's your business plan? Great idea. What's your business plan? <laughs> what's the cash flow looking like? How much money do you need? When can I expect my return on this investment? What's your labor cost looking like? I used to work in, a, I worked in restaurants, and, and, and I can remember one chef coming up to me. You know, I was really good. I could get the food out. He came to me. He's like, you're a really good cook. You can get the food out. He said, now let me teach you how to run the business. And so he took me up on this wing and taught me about food costs and labor costs. And we need to keep it at this percentage. Otherwise, the restaurant's not profitable. This is why you guys have to do it like this. And I learned all of that. I'm like, so most of the executive chefs aren't even cooking. They're making sure the restaurant's profitable. Why a lot of restaurants fail, not because the food's bad, because the person running it doesn't know anything about business management. And you might have a talent, but talent is not going to grant you success. You might have a burden, but burden by itself will not grant you success. You've got to have a plan and a strategy and prepare for the day that God drops the resources in your hand. And that's what's happening here for Nehemiah. Nehemiah's countenance has fallen before the king, which is a dangerous position because it's the king. You just don't go before the king all sad looking. You don't want to make the king sad. And fortunately, Nehemiah has favor before the king, and the king asks him questions. Why are you sad? This is the B. Crow version now, not the King James. Why is thine countenance fallen before mine face? <laughs> Praise God. Me and my wife talk to each other in the King James a lot. It's fun. Amen. No, it's nerdy. Okay, fine, whatever. But anyway, why is your, why, why is your countenance falling? Why, why, why are you sad? He said, because of the state of my people. I can't help it. I'm sorry. Then the king opened the door. What do you want me to do? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Verse 5, if it please the king, and if I got favor in your sight, send me to Judah that I may build it. And the king said, how long are you going to be there? And when you're going to return? And he had an answer, a set time. Moreover, I need letters. I need your authority. Give, me, give them to the governors beyond the river because I'm going to need some wood. So I need one guy, the Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. He, he, he had to been thinking this out. I need you to write him a letter so I can get some timbers. And I need to make the beams for the gates in the palace and for the wall of the city. And for the house that I shall enter into. So he said, I need money, not just for the stuff I'm going to build, but for to build my own house while I'm there. This is meticulous. This is not, this is not just some fly-by-night uh, uh, burden here. He's thought this out. He's planned this out. And the Bible says, the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So, yes, the burden's got to match some planning and organization and structure. And when it does, you can build something great for God. Because lots of people that had great ideas and great burdens, but failed in the area of discipline, planning, organizing, structuring things to actually accomplish the burden that they feel upon their hearts. And so you might not think those things are spiritual, but they are. And if you want to be used in the kingdom of God, it's a good idea to enhance your skills in this area. Go get John Maxwell's catalog. 
I got nobody, but hmm, Brother Wayne back there. Go get 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. That's just one of them. He's got a lot of them out there. I got a few of them in my catalog that I've read. Leaders come up to us, you, you need this book right here. Leaders versus manager, the, the, the different levels of, 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 of leadership. Go get some books on structuring and organization. Well, that's not spiritual. It's not. Yes, it is spiritual. Because if you have a burden to do something for God, those things are going to help you accomplish it. It's wise to expand your area, to expand your territory in those areas. Because you're going to need it. You're going to need it if you're going to do something for God. Otherwise, we're just wasting time and wasting resources. There's a parable that Jesus told about that too. He was talking to a husband, man of a garden, and there was a tree that wasn't producing any fruit. The Lord was like, it's taking up space and resources. Cut it down. And the husband man said, wait. Wait, let me dig around in a little bit. Put some fertilizer and all. You know, I'm paraphrasing. Why, why would the Lord do that? Tear down this tree that's not producing anything. Because it's consuming resources. Similar thing with the parable of the talents, which means this. If we're going to be used of God in a greater dimension, we've got to expand our capacity, which is both discipline on the spiritual side and the natural side. We've got to be able to handle business. We have to be able to delegate. We have to be able to crunch some numbers, count the cost. We have to budget and be able to stick to a budget. <laughs> so our men that have large churches are probably good businessmen. Because from a pastoral perspective, I can tell you, a lot of what we do here has to do with management. As a matter of fact, the Lord said, if you can't manage natural riches... How will your heavenly father give you true riches? So God is actually looking at how we do things naturally to judge what he's going to put into our hands spiritually. If you be faithful over a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many. And I see a trend that people go super hard on the spiritual side. I want to hear from God, and I want to, I want to hear from the heavens, and I want, to, I want to get visions like Daniel, and I want to get stuff like Ezekiel, God, and get all of this burden, but neglect the natural just wisdom that Solomon had to be able to build that city that we just looked at. Wisdom to know when you don't have it and you need to add people around you that are better than you at some things. Solomon had that wisdom. He knew they didn't have the knowledge to build the temple, so he hired Hiram, king of Tyre, to come in and, and be the architect that helped him to erect that structure. Praise God. I know it's not spiritual, but it's just as necessary is what I'm trying to tell you. Not this or that. We need them both. And Nehemiah is a good example of that. And the opportunity opened up, and he was able to present a very succinct plan before the king. I'm going to be gone this long. I'm going to need this. I'll need this. I need to talk to this person. I'm going to build this and this and this, and then I'm coming back. Now, if I'm the financier, the underwriter of this project, that's a good investment right there. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. It's a good investment. Try it on your job. Don't just ask your manager for a raise. Justify your raise. <laughs> You're laughing. I did that. Oh, 100%. I went into him. I had a review, and I was, I was a DevOps engineer. I worked for a software company. My responsibility was to automate a lot of things in our software infrastructure to make stuff happen automatically. And so I developed processes that saved us 30 minutes on every time we did it. Instead of it taking 30 minutes, it would take us now two minutes. And this is something that we did hundreds of times a year. So I did the math, and I went to my boss and said, look, based off of the automation that I built, I'm saving us a half hour every time we build out a new server. And last year, we built out about 300 servers. That means I saved you my salary per hour over 300 times last year. You, can't, you can say no to you. It's going to be hard to say no to that versus just coming to him and say, give me a raise because I'm worth it. Some of y'all are mad at me right now. I don't care. I don't care. You got to think like that. These are business people. They want to they put their money in a place where they know that there's going to be a return. And furthermore, they're looking for you to have that type of mindset. 
So grow in those areas. And I guarantee you, you'll see God open up many doors for you that were not previously opened up. Yes, it's going to start with prayer. but God's going to require some things out of you in order for you to build. Amen? All right, let's go to chapter 3. I'm sorry. Uh, let's, let's finish out chapter 2. I cursed myself, Brother John. I said I was going to get to 4, didn't I? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, all right. Let's, let's pick up in verse 12. We'll, we'll, we'll finish out chapter 2. We'll at least get to the homework question. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 12. And I arose in the night, and I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, into the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, into the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then I went I up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Mm -hmm. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire? Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Anamite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his, we his servants will arise and build, that ye have no portion nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. This one, yes, that's the answer of the homework. Which which of the men came against Sanballat, Tobiah, and and Geshem? You hear more about Sanballat and Tobiah uh, than the other than the other guys, but they are there. And so the next step is this: if you want to do something for God, you've got to go inspect. You just want to go in blind. So you've got to inspect. What's that? Okay, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll replace the batteries after today. But you, you've got to, you got to, you got to take inventory. You've got to evaluate the situation. You've got to come in and see what it is. So he didn't just come in there and say, "All right, let's build." He came in and walked throughout. Didn't tell anybody while he was there. Not even the people that would build with him, which is a point of wisdom. Not everybody needs to know your plans right away. Just hold your peace. That's the King James version. I would say, "Shut up." <laughs> You don't need to run and tell on everybody just yet. Not, on, not to the people that will be on your side or the people that will be against you. Go and evaluate the situation first. Notice that each time before they went into the promised land, God sent spies. Sent them first time for 40, for 40 days, 12 of them, spy of the land. And when they came into Jericho, they sent two spies in there and found Rahab and her family. Because God wants them to come in and inspect it and take evaluation of the thing that you're coming towards, to know exactly what the work is because you have an idea back in the king's palace, but you don't really know all the details until you actually go there and look. If I hire a guy come out and say, you know what, I, I want to redo all the duct work in here, they'll give me a quote based off of what they think needs to be done, but they'll say, mm, this is probably going to grow once I actually get in your plenum and see what's going on. <laughs> you know, because once you get up there, you'll see, oh, Lord. Double that quote. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you, you, you've got to go down there and you've got to inspect it. And at his point, he knows that the opposition is there kind of waiting on him. So he's, he's very careful about who he lets into his planning, which is a point of wisdom. You don't let your emotions and your excitement cause you to do things that are unwise. Like Joseph telling your dream to all your brothers and they, they already hate you. <laughs> just kind of kind of keep your mouth closed and at the right time you reveal why you're really here even Jesus did it when he healed people he says shh don't tell anybody which is you know if you can if you were blind and you see him, you're going to tell somebody <laughs> they might find out hey you're watching birds fly around <laughs> what, what, what happened 
But why? Because it wasn't time for the world to understand and realize who he was because if they would have, they would have made him king before he could be crucified. So we told him, shh, don't tell anybody. People wanted to follow him. He said, no, not yet. It's not time. Not his time yet. So there's a level of wisdom. If you're going to accomplish something, especially when it comes to opposition, don't reveal your plan too quickly. So then he finally comes and tells them, we're going to rebuild the walls. of God has sent me here to do a work, and I'm asking who is with me. And he stirs them all up, gets everybody on his side. Woo, let's rebuild this wall. And then as soon as they get done, guess who shows up? Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem. And what did they do? How? What's the first level of, of, of opposition? Psychological first. Well, it's all psychological, but this one's, it, it kind of progresses. And this is a good thing to study. This is how the enemy will come at you. First, he's going to mock you. When they heard it, verse number 19, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Well, you're going to, you're going to, <laughs> Lord, how can I say this nicely? I'll just, I'll just say, they're going to mock you. They're going to make it feel like what you're doing is dumb. This is pointless. This is a waste of time. You don't know what you're doing. This is too big for you. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, you're going to build a church? Nobody goes to church anymore. <laughs> and if you're not careful, you can let these things discourage you. You can let the enemy start to put things into your mind. Paul says it this, this that the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's the enemy in your head telling you the opposite of what your burden is, trying to get you to release the thing that you just planned for, that you just prepared for, that you just prayed for. He's trying to talk you out of it so he doesn't have to fight you later on. If I can get him at stage one, I don't have to deal with him at stage 10. So he said, ha, we'll start off light, see if this works. The devil's loud. Enemies are loud. and He'll use people too. Just be loud. Kind of like Goliath standing in the valley for 40 days. Send me a man. He's just loud. One stone, he's going to be knocked down to the ground. He's just loud. He's big, but he's a pushover. And that's what he'll do. He'll talk. And he'll get you thinking you're incapable. Anybody ever felt incapable before? He'll get you thinking you're not qualified. He'll get you thinking you don't have the right pedigree. Let's put it into context. You have no construction degree for this wall. <laughs> you have no permit. It's going to take months just to get a permit. They tried to tell me that coming into this building because right where this pole was, going right to that thing, there was an office there with a big old 400-amp, uh, three-phase service panel right in the middle of the thing. And the landlord, one of the things I had to fight the landlord was is moving that panel. Oh, you'll never find an electrician that's going to move that for you in a month. Now, it's going to take five months just to pull a permit to move that amount of voltage from one side of the building to the other. I said, watch me. All right, well, you got to use my electrician. I said, send me a list. He sent me a list, and I chose a guy, and they came out there, and we got it done. We got it done. Huh? That was his fault. Praise God. <laughs> He's a master electrician. He's insured. That's on him. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't have to worry about that. I just had to kind of check up on him, him and his crew, and make sure they had what they needed. But if I would have listened to him, we would have been in another building or potentially paying much more because it's, the real estate in this area is very expensive. And I knew that this was the place. So what I'm saying is you're going to have to be able to overcome opposition. And don't think every time you get ready to do something for God that God's just going to fly open every door for you and cause you not to go through any obstacles. That's not how it works. Paul said there is an effectual open door, but there be many adversaries because the enemy wants to stop you just as much as God wants to empower you. And it's going to test your fortitude. It's going to test your faith. It's going to test your resolve. You have to have a made-up mind. This must get done. Praise God. So the first level is going to try to mock you. But what's Nehemiah's response? The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and what? Build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Now, these are 
uh, Samaritans. That's why he said that, which is speaks of uh, a brewing feud between the Jews and the Samaritans that Jesus kind of reveals as he goes through Samaria. They didn't like each other. He said North Korea, South Korea. Uh, I doubt it was be, be to that. Maybe, I don't know. But I, we talked earlier about Malachi being the last book. And then the first book of the New Testament starts with Matthew. You know, there's a 400-year period of silence between there, meaning that God wasn't speaking to anybody or through anybody. But there's lots of history that happened in between those 400 years. And one of them is the growing feud between the area of Sumeria, and not Sumeria, Samaria, and the area of Judea. Because the Samaritans had their hodgepodge mix of Judaism and some pagan things. And they were a mix of Gentiles, particularly Assyrians, and Jewish people. They didn't like the Jews at all. If they went through that territory, they would be raped, they would be robbed, they would be killed. So there was lots of beef between Judea and Samaria. And the genesis of it is right here. Sanballat and these guys, uh, they're from the territory of Samaria. That's why Nehemiah says, you have no part with us in this. We don't need your help. We don't need your advice. Just get out and let us build. We're going to build. And so this is, you would think that would be the end of it, but no, no, he's coming back. Amen. We'll pull up right there um, for, for, this, for this time. We'll get to the completion of the wall, probably the next two chapters um, next time. And so for a homework question the next week, what is the last obstacle that Nehemiah has to face? What's the last one? Got to read it out. I got you. No? You can let me believe it. <laughs> yeah, Pastor, you got me. That would have puffed up my ego a little bit. I would have felt like. I will not confirm nor deny. <laughs> Amen. Does anybody have any questions before we close out, wrap up tonight? No, 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 no further details required there. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I will find it for you. Because I want to find it myself. I will find it for you. Um, I think there is a link, but I'll find it for you now. Uh, remind me. Brother John, send me a text. Remind me. Because if I don't, if I don't, and I'll, I'll try to have it for you the next time we meet for Bible study. She wanted the, uh, the chart that links the prophets to the kings that they prophesied to and the books that they're in. You have it there? You have a version of it there? Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll find you the one that's on my mind, and then that'll, that'll, that'll help you. Because it, it helped me tremendously. Sometimes when you see stuff graphically, it just makes it make sense, gives you some context. But yes, ma'am, I will do that. Okay. Okay, thank you. You had something, Brother Ellie? Oh. Nobody else? I think it's the spaghetti. You got to watch how much you feed them. Everybody's gonna, and it's warm in here. Everybody's going to go to sleep. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know. It's just, it's, we've done it this way for so long. Um, it, and it's, if we do that, we'd have to start earlier. Uh, we, we, that's an idea. We 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 could do t to go place. Okay, thou hast rightly spoken. Hey, I, well, you well, no, she's the one that her family's been doing the work for years now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna lean on lean on their side, and uh, uh, we just have to you just have to eat eat it eat eat proportionally. You know, don't, 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 don't eat the whole plate right away. <laughs> I'm messing with you, sis. Let's go. Yes, sir. What do I think? 
I have lots of opinions on that. Um, none of them can be validated or substantiated with any facts. So, oh yeah, it's a lot. This is the timing and the the messaging is all very suspicious to me. So I lean on the side of conspiracy when these things happen. And history has shown us, especially in the last three years, that conspiracy is a, tend to be more closer to the truth than the official narrative these days. Um, I can tell you what I think. I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't like using this particular platform because people tend to take what I say about these things to heart because of the position that I'm in. This is just pure speculation. I think they shot the thing down. I think it was some foul play, particularly for where it was in the northern part of Iran, um, and their messaging around it was very suspicious, and the timing is horrible. Now, what it means for them, I don't know, because Ayatollah has most of the authority, even though it's kind of an unspoken thing. Everybody knows that he kind of runs that country, that nation. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if Israel had some role. That's just my opinion. job. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Make America great again. <laughs> probably didn't. Probably didn't. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me if he was busy at, at his next rally in his new Iran. Terrorists. You don't have freedom of press. If you report the wrong thing, they kill you. They kill you. They Father, we love you today. We thank you today for your wisdom, Lord God. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your kindness. Father, I thank you for your word here tonight, Lord. I thank you that you've called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I pray over every burden that you place upon our hearts, Lord. Help us to bring that into manifestation, Lord God. To put the work behind it, Lord God. To put the structure and the planning behind it, Lord. And to marry it, oh God, with your anointing, your power, Lord. Your supernatural provision, Lord God, and resources that we can accomplish what you have placed on our hearts, Lord. But we know that we're in the last day. Lord God, and it's your will that none perish, but that all come to repentance. Father, I pray that you would help us with that, Lord God. Help us to continue to go forward, Lord God, regardless of any obstacles, regardless of any enemy that tries to deter us from what you have spoken over our lives. I pray that you would help us to complete it, Father. We love you tonight, oh God. We bless you tonight. I pray for traveling mercies as we leave this place to make it home safely. We be careful to bless your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody said amen. All right, love you guys. I'll see you later on in the week. Jesus. Christ.